Hey guys, in this video we're going to talk about conservation of energy with calorimetry. So in the introductory video you already talked about heat loss versus heat gain. So whenever I have a reaction or, or I'm putting two substances together that are at different temperatures, one of those substances is going to lose the heat, all right? So if it's released to the surroundings, therefore it was going to be an exothermic process. And one of those substances are going to be gaining that same amount of heat. It's just equal but opposite in direction. One will be exothermic and the other will be endothermic. And so how do we work problems? What are we doing whenever we're working with the conservation of energy? There will always be some unknown that you're trying to find whenever you're working the conservation of energy problems. It could be an unknown initial temperature. It can be an unknown mass. It can be an unknown specific heat. Or maybe it's the unknown final temperature whenever you put two things together. Now there's one conceptual thing we have to talk about before we dive right in. Whenever I take two substances that are at different temperatures and I put them together, they are going to arrive at something called thermal equilibrium. So what is thermal equilibrium? Thermal equilibrium is when you have two different substances put together and they arrive at the same final temperature. So it doesn't matter what temperature the others, the other two substances started out as. When I put those two substances together, they are going to arrive at the same temperature eventually, and that is what we call thermal equilibrium. So that concept is very important to know because if we put two opposing things together with different temperatures, their final temperature is always going to be the same for both of them because they are arriving at thermal equilibrium over time. So now that we have all of that conceptually out of the way, let's look at what we are given in our example problem here. So we have a bar of iron that is really hot. It's about 300 degrees Celsius. I say it's really hot. It's not too terribly hot, but it's a little warm. And so that's the heat radiating off of it, just so you guys can visualize what's happening here. And so the mass of that is five grams. The initial temperature is 300 degrees Celsius. And the specific heat is also given to us here for iron. Now, what are we going to do with this? Well, we're gonna drop it into a container of water. And so this is our coffee cup calorimetry. And in that water, we have 100 milliliters and we have an initial temperature of the water as 25 degrees Celsius, and we also know the specific heat. So my question with this scenario is, what is going to be the final temperature, that thermal equilibrium that we reach whenever we put these two things at different temperatures together? So we are going to have to use this equation to find that out. Now the other equations, what you've been working with, um, with your um, substances, with your reactions and stuff, you've just had to do Q equals MC delta T or whatever heat capacity, molar heat capacity unit you're working with. You've only had to do it with one. Well, here we have heat that's generated from this entity. We also have heat that's generated from here. And so when we put these two together, they're going to be exchanging an amount of energy with each other. And so that's why we have to use this approach for this particular problem, rather than just doing Q equals MC delta T for one of them. So when we are working with this, we have to figure out who is the thing that is going to lose heat, which one is the thing that's going to gain heat. So let's look at iron here. Iron is at a pretty large temperature compared to the water. So when I take this iron and I drop it in, what do you think will happen to the temperature of the iron? Well, I hope you said that that temperature should cool off a little bit, right? My temperature should decrease. What will happen if I put the iron into this water? Well, I hope conceptually you're saying that that temperature should rise a little bit. So as a result, this is what has happened because of this. 
who has lost the heat? The thing that is going to decrease in temperature is going to lose the heat because it's transferring it to the other substance. So whoever is at higher temperature at the beginning, that is always going to be the thing that is losing the heat in the process. The thing that is at lower temperature in the beginning, that is the thing that will always be gaining the heat in the process. So we should put in here that iron is going to be the species that is losing the heat and water is the species that is going to be gaining the heat so we can keep everything nice and straight and we don't get our data mixed. So now what do we do? We are going to take our Q value of the iron and write it all out. So we're going to say negative mass of iron, specific heat of iron, delta T is final temperature of iron minus initial temperature of iron. So do you see how I'm writing all of this stuff in here? Okay. And then I'm going to set it equal to everything dealing with water. So that is going to be positive, right? This negative came from here. This positive came, comes from there. So we're going to take the mass of water, the specific heat of water, and our final minus initial temperature for water. So all I'm doing here is just writing out MC delta T for everything dealing with iron and MC delta T for everything dealing with water. Now we get to actually plug in our values that are given to us in the problem. So in the problem, we have negative, our mass of iron is five grams. Our specific heat of iron is 0.449 joules per gram degrees Celsius. And our final temperature is the thing that is unknown. So we're going to call that TF. Remember that TF of iron and TF of water are going to be the same number. So we're going to leave this as a variable. Minus TI of iron, which was given to me, which is 300 degrees Celsius. So right now I can see a couple of units that end up canceling out. Um, our degree Celsius will end up canceling out. Our grams will end up canceling out and le we're left with joules. So do you see that is how we calculate our Q. Now we're going to do the same exact thing on this side. We're going to plug in plus mass of water. So how do we find the mass of water from this? Because the density of water is one, what that means is however much the volume is of water, that is also equal to the mass of the water. So that's something very important conceptually to know. Because density of water is one, whatever milliliters I have is also equal to my grams. So we're gonna plug this into here. So 100, grams of water. Specific heat of water is 4.184 joules per gram degrees Celsius. Now again, I do not know that final temperature. So I'm going to plug in TF as my variable and I'm going to subtract TI, which is 25 degrees Celsius. All of my units line up just like on this side. So we're good to go. I have an unknown on both of these sides. And so what we're going to have to do to solve for this is distribute and get my vari like variables on the same side of the equation. So all this is is now an application of algebra. So I'm going to write with black for this section and make sure. Yeah. So if I take five times 0.449 times TF, I worked it out previously. So this times this times TF, you see how I'm distributing through here, right? And so that is going to equal 2.245 times TF, right? Because it's negative five 
times 0.449 times TF. So that's actually negative 2.245. Don't forget to also distribute that negative sign through. And then if I take negative five times 0.449 times minus 300, that is going to be plus 673.5. So that is this side of the equation kind of simplified. Now we're gonna do the same thing over here and try to condense it. We're trying to condense this reaction or this equation down to where we can get TF by itself. So I'm gonna take 100 times 4.18 times TF, and this, I do not have to distribute a negative sign through because it's all positive here. And so this will end up being positive 418.4 times TF, and then minus 100 times 4.184, and this is why I put the minus sign there, because I will get, um, when I distribute this through and multiply by negative 25, I get minus 10460. So that's 10460. So now I have sort of simplified this equation down to where I have something with a variable, something without, something with a variable, something without. So now what my goal is, is to get my variables together on the same side of the equation and the non-variables on the same side of the equation. That's opposite of the variable side. I hope that makes sense. So what I decided to do is take plus 2.245 TF on this side to cancel it out. So I'm going to have to do it to this side, 2.245 TF. And when I do that calculation, that gives me 420.645 TF. What I also want to do is take this value and get it away from my TF side. So I'm going to add 10460 on this side to cancel it out plus 10460. And so now this will be on the opposite side of my equal sign. And so that ends up being 11133.5. Now I am at a much more simplified algebraic equation where all I have to do is divide by 420.645 on both sides to be able to cancel it out. So divide by 420645, and that will give me my final temperature, which ends up being 26.47. And what is our temperature reading in? It's in degrees Celsius. So let me write that a little bit better for you guys to see. So 26.47 degrees Celsius is equal to my final temperature. So what that is telling me is that when this iron gets put into this container, they will approach thermal equilibrium and both of them will end up being, once they've reached thermal equilibrium, a final temperature of 26.47 degrees Celsius. Now, does this number make sense? Well, we always like to see if our math makes sense, right? Do our numbers make sense? Well. This was very hot, and we said if we put it in the cooler water, it should cool down. So it went from 300 to 26.47. Oh yeah, that cooled down drastically, right? Well, is that a reasonable amount to cool down by? Well, do you see how there's such a very um, small specific heat for iron? So what that means, this small specific heat, if you remember from our video earlier, means that we have a drastic temperature change. And that's okay, so that fits conceptually what's supposed to happen. Well, what happened to our water? Well, our water increased a little bit from 25 to 26.47. Does that make sense? Well, I had something hot being put into that cooler water, so yeah, that makes sense that that temperature increased. Now, did it increase by very much? And the answer is no. 
but look at this specific heat value compared to the iron. It is significantly larger. So the larger that my specific heat quantity is, the less change, um, drastic of change, that my temperature will be. So this number is very reasonable. And another way you can check yourself, remember how we said that heat lost should equal heat gained? What I can do is plug in my final temperature and calculate the Q of the iron. I could also plug in the final temperature and plug in the Q of my water. What should we see from that? Well, when I plug in all of this information and find Q, and plug in all of this information and find Q, we should see that both of these values are equal to each other. They are just opposite in sign. And so that's a, a good way for you to check yourself. Now, what we did here, finding that final temperature, this is the hardest type of question that you can be asked with the conservation of energy. If you can do this problem here, you can do any of them because if they ask for you to find the mass, they will give you the final temperature to plug in and you're just solving for one unknown. You don't have to worry about getting all of these like terms on the same side and whatnot as much as you do for this problem. So I hope this was um, a, a good video for you guys to understand how to do the conservation of energy problems. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Have a good day.